All right. Welcome back. Last time we talked about the Hall effect. And one of the things that we learned was that in some metals and in some semiconductors, current is actually carried by the absence of electrons, which is kind of weird. What we mean by that is that if you have an electron C and you have the kind of situation where it looks not so much like the electron C is flowing by, but the main thing that you see is bubbles in the electron C going by, then you may as well address the problem in terms of holes. Holes are like bubbles in the electron C. And you know, there's some situations where that's not a useful idea. If we make the analogy with water, then water coming out of a water hose. You want to think of the water. You don't want to think of the absence of water coming into the hose. But in the case of the Acme bubble omatic here, putting air bubbles through the fish tank, you didn't really want to analyze that in terms of the backflow of the water around the bubbles. It was easier to track the bubbles, right? So sometimes it's useful to think in terms of those holes. OK, and the Hall effect was something you could use in order to tell inside your material was it mainly carried, was the current mainly carried by electrons, or was the current mainly carried by holes? Do you have any questions from last time? Here's the question. If I have a proton moving with this velocity to the right, and there's an applied magnetic field into the board, I just want you to, coming back, you know, this is Monday morning, coming back after the weekend, just want you to figure out which direction does the, the force, the magnetic force, um, point for that proton. Okay, and there's your equation there. So first answer on your own, and then I'll give you time to talk to your neighbor. With almost 150 votes in, tell me, tell me what you're thinking. Who, who would like to... Monday morning, kind of remind us how this goes. Yes, please. Thanks. Up. OK. Do you, you want to tell us? OK. OK. All right. So he's saying, right hand rule. You can find your right hand, right? So right hand. And I say, the velocity is pointing this way. The magnetic field is into the board. So I curve my fingers that way. And then my thumb points up. <clears throat> Some people, actually, the the first lecture, so you know there's an 8.30 lecture and a 9.30 lecture. The 8.30 lecture taught me a new trick that I, I hadn't really used myself. And they said, look, point your, point your index finger along V, and then your second finger along B, and then your thumb points up along um, the force. Okay? So in both cases, we get that it's up. Now do it for an electron. Okay, so same situation, same magnetic field, same velocity, but now it's an electron. Which way does it point in this direction in this case? All right, overwhelmingly you're all getting the same answer. So anybody want to walk us through how to do it this, kind, this time? You're volunteering? Or are you volunteering him? Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, the velocity is the right. Okay, all right, so we take. The velocity is this direction, and then curl the fingers into the magnetic field. We would have gotten up, but it's an electron, so we just have to switch the sign because of the, the charge on the electron. Or, just the left or ooh, heresy. OK, so somebody up front <coughs> will remain nameless, Alex, um, pointed out that you could use the left hand rule for electrons, right? I didn't get your name wrong, did I? OK, good. Right. So you, ca you can. I, I prefer not. Two. I prefer to put that sign in afterwards. But if you know how to do that, and if you know that you're not going to mess it up, but you're going to only use the left-hand rule, the unauthorized version, for um, electrons, yes, totally works. You're totally right. All right, any other questions? OK. So that was to get us thinking along the right lines, because we'd like to be thinking about this in the context of a hunk of material. OK, so now we're going to take a hunk of material in the shape of a bar. Let this be a conductive material, so let's say a metal bar. And we have a magnetic field pointed into the board, and we just want to take that bar and pull it, okay? So we're just going to make that bar move at a constant velocity, and we want to see what's going to happen to it, all right? So the, so the bar is moving at a constant velocity. It's the same situation that you just calculated. There are electrons inside the bar that are free to move because inside of a metal, the electrons we say that the electrons are part of the electron C because they're fluid, they're liquid, they're, they're free to move around. And so they can move. And when they feel this magnetic force, as you all calculated, downward, then electrons will start 
moving. All right, now, question is though, I'm just going to keep moving this bar along. We're just going to walk with this thing, we're just like walking a dog. We're just going to walk it for a while, all right, in this magnetic field. And the whole time, it's got this magnetic force on it, all right? As you pointed out, the right-hand rule says these electrons are going to tend to go downward. But how far is that going to last? I'm, going to, I'm just going to keep pulling the bar at constant speed. Will I get a current forever in here? Maybe, maybe what'll happen is that we just invented a new weapon. And as we drag this thing along, the electrons just keep moving and we just start shooting electrons out the bottom. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> Lots of good grins on that one, but probably not gonna happen, right? So what happens? The electrons reach the end of the bar and then what? Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna get constant current, right? If this is a free bar, I'm not gonna get constant current. This is very much like, and, and this event is coming up, so you better be mentally prepared for it. But this is very much like all of us outside of the doors at Best Buy before it opens the Friday after Thanksgiving, right? So the crowd comes up to the, to the doors, and they can get to the doors, but they can't get in. So the crowd kind of pushes against, but the doors aren't open at the Best Buy the day after Thanksgiving, and you get stuck. So here at the bottom, the electrons just kind of pile up, all right? So they'll pile up, and then they'll exert forces on each other due to the pileup, right? So we'll get net charges gathering down here, little few electrons gathering at the bottom. There'll be some exposed positive charge at the top, so when the electron C shifts down, there'll be a little bit of, of exposed um, atomic cores at the top. Now please don't think that they're bare atomic cores, you know, protons just dangling off the end. It's just that the electron C shifts a little bit relative to the atomic cores, exposing some positive charge at the top, negative charge at the bottom. So charge builds up, and as the charge builds up then, I get a voltage due to that, and then there's an electric field that counteracts all this motion. So in the steady state, right, I'll pull this bar across, yes, there's a magnetic field that pushes the electrons down, but then as the electrons build up, they exert a force back on the ones that are trying to come in, and then I get a net, um, well, I get a steady state situation, okay? So in steady state, the charge will build up until there's an electric field that balances all this stuff out, all right? And so then, in the steady state, the net force on the electrons will be the electric force <coughs> plus the magnetic force. So the magnetic force we already talked about was QV cross B. The electric force QE, I don't know what the electric field is, but here's how we can calculate it, right? Because, you know, one way we could, think about the electric field as well. If I knew the pattern of charges down here, I could calculate it that way, but that's the hard way. The easy way is to know that, well, the charge is just going to build up until I have no net force on this thing, right? And that's because electrons are liquid inside of a conductor. If there is a force on them, they will move, and so they will move until there's no net force. The time scale on this, by the way, is about a picosecond. Electrons are really, really fast. So this will happen until I get no net force. So that means this term must balance that term. The V and the B are at right angles, okay? So then the magnitude of this guy is QVB, so it must balance out the electric field there. And in steady state, the charges will just arrange themselves so that there's a net electric field in the bar that's opposing all this motion, all right? So that'll be our steady state case in this situation, all right? Do you have any questions about that? Okay. So there's something a bit odd here, and then I have a steady state situation of a conductor, and I've got an electric field inside of it. Are you okay with that? Okay, up until now we've, we've tended to say that the steady state situation inside of a conductor was at the net, you know, the, okay. So we basically, we've just got a balance going on, right? So we've got a balance going on, it's steady state, it's all right. Okay, so now, all right, we thought about this and we said, okay, the electrons aren't going to shoot out the bottom. Bummer. We would have liked to have seen that. But if we connected the thing up to a circuit, we could actually use it to do something. So let's do that. Let's connect it up to a circuit. So now I've got the same situation. I've got a bar in a magnetic field that's going into the board. We're going to move the bar along again at constant velocity. But this time, I've got the bar on rails, okay? So it's, it's electrically connected to conductors above and below, and then there's a, there's a resistor that's connecting those bars. So I make a complete circuit here, but the path uh, of current is going to change as I move the bar, all right? 
and everything's metal except for the, um, the resistor. So same situation, I'm going to move the thing along, and I still have this force, right? So here's the hand that's going to push this thing along. And as I do this, I still get a force downward uh, on the electrons, all right? But what happens to the electrons now when they get to the bottom of the bar? Are they going to get piled up again like the previous case? OK, right, they just keep going in this case. So this is like all of us outside the doors of Best Buy the day after Thanksgiving, and now the doors open, OK? So there's an electrical connection here, so the electrons can just flow on through, and we get <coughs> electrons moving clockwise. We know the conventional current goes in the opposite direction, so conventional current goes counterclockwise. So I can think, though, about, well, OK, I could use this to get something, right? I could use this to drive a circuit element like a resistor or maybe a light bulb if you actually want it to do something useful. Um, and I could think about, well, how much work are we going to have to do in order to keep this bar moving at constant velocity? Okay? You might think, well, maybe once the transients are gone, right? maybe once I just get the thing going and, and just kind of push it, maybe I can just let go and it'll keep going. All right? But there's, there's something fishy with the energy conservation in that. All right? because we need to, to think through the, all the forces that are on the bar. So when I'm, in order to keep a constant velocity on this thing, I actually have to fight something. The thing we have to fight is that once there's a current established in the bar, that current now means that, that um, there's another force on the bar. All right? So I could think of, we could think first in terms of electrons. At first, I'm pushing the bar along, so I'm moving electrons uh, across magnetic field lines, but then the electrons start moving down as well. So now there's this downward component to their velocity. That downward component to their velocity causes another force, and that's a force due to the magnetic field. So you can see it in the equations here. So F is QV cross B, the magnetic force on a charged particle. In the context of a current-carrying wire, we take the single particle QV and turn it into I delta L. So in the context of the current-carrying wire, this becomes I delta L cross B. So as soon as I set up a constant current situation, now there's this current with a crossed magnetic field, okay, I delta L cross B. So I have another, another force involved. So it's not just the force that my hand puts on the bar, but there's the force that the magnetic field is exerting on the bar as well. Question? If you were to apply a current, is that like a railgun? Is that what a railgun is? If you apply it in a place with a resistor? Probably. I'd have to look up how <laughs> I'd have to look up how railgun works. Um, but yes, you can you can totally use these concepts if you would like to use these concepts to make projectiles at high velocities. You can, and I, that's what you're really getting at is can we use this to build a gun? Yes, you can. Okay, yeah. The railgun fires a projectile faster, farther, and with greater impact than a gun that uses gunpowder. Where a 5-inch conventional gun can send a projectile 13 nautical miles, the Navy says the railgun can send it 110 nautical miles. Chief of Naval Research Rear Admiral Matt Winter said he expects the railgun will be on Navy warships in the next decade. It's like a flux capacitor, right? You're sitting there thinking about these next generation and futuristic ideas. And we've got scientists who have designed these, and it's coming to life. Sea trials begin in 2016, made possible since researchers reduce the amount of space the gun needs. Yeah, don't try that at home. Okay, or if you do, don't tell them I told you. Okay, so we've got the, the current moving along. Um, there's a force backwards on the bar. And in steady state, those two forces must balance, right? So to keep this bar moving, because the current then makes them, you know, because of the current, the magnetic field exerts a force back on the bar, I have to fight in order to keep this bar going. Fight just means I'm going to keep putting um, a force on there. So it's this situation you've already seen. When I run current through these wires, they get attracted to each other. Remember, we saw there's two cases. Either the current's parallel, this is the parallel current case, and they get attracted, or the current's in opposite directions and they get repelled. It's a little harder to see the case of repelling, but there it is. Okay, so when they're attracted to each other, it's pretty clear. And I managed to do it with no smoke coming off the terminals yet. Um, so I smell smoke, though. So, <laughs> um, so I can calculate. In the, so, so similar things were going on here, right? There was a current in the presence of a crossed magnetic field, and the magnetic field exerted a force on the wire. So same thing here. That's what the hand has to fight, is that, um, that force from the magnetic field. So we can calculate then, well, how much 
work am I going to have to do? How much power am I going to have to put into this thing in order to keep it moving? So to keep the bar moving at constant velocity, I'm fighting that, that force um, from the magnetic field, which as we said is I delta L cross B. And it's got to be equal and opposite to the force of the hand. And the magnitude of that is ILB, OK? Why did I skip the sine theta? I skipped sine theta. Yeah, exactly. Everything's at, at right angles here. And sine of a right angle, sine of 90 degrees is 1. So ILB. So the work that I have to do, okay, the work that the hand does, is going to be the force dotted into the distance. And they're parallel in this case. So I just get F delta x. So the magnitude of the force is ILB times some distance delta x that I move it over. But I'm going to keep moving it. Okay, so I'm going to keep moving it. So as I do that, I have to put in a certain amount of work per time in order to keep this going. So work per time is power. It's the definition of power, is energy per unit time. So I have to put in that amount of work per unit time, which is ILB delta x over delta t. Once I see a delta x over delta t, I should think in terms of a speed or a velocity. So we'll write this down as a speed, ILB v. And that's the work, well, that's the power, energy per unit time, that I have to put in to keep this going. All right? Now, I can also then recast this. This is really close to a familiar equation. Once I say the power is current times something, that should look familiar. Okay? Power is current times a voltage drop. Right? The power in, in an element in a circuit is current times the voltage across that element. So this must be a voltage. All right? And we can see that that actually is a voltage. So let me show you how that is. So the voltage across this bar, or if you want to think of it as EMF, you can, um, there's an electric field in here. right? There's an electric field in the bar. And so the electric field in the bar we already calculated is magnitude of V times magnitude of B in steady state. And then to get the total voltage drop across the bar, I just multiply that electric field by the distance. So if L is the length of the bar, and by L here we mean uh, length of the current path, right? Not the total length of this bar, but the length that goes from one rail to the other rail. All right? So that's this L here. So VBL, and that's the, the voltage drop across it. Actually, it's EMF. It's the voltage increase across it. Uh, the power, then, is I times this EMF, which matches I delta V, okay, as we would expect. Do you have any questions about how that all went? OK, so to keep that going. Now, um, you can use this to do useful things. Okay, This basic concept of taking um, a wire and moving it in a magnetic field, right? we just generated power. Okay, Didn't use it to do anything particularly useful. In fact, where's all my energy going? Right? Wh wh where's it ultimately going? Yeah, it goes into the resistor. So I'm putting work in by the hand. Okay, I'm converting it to electrical um, energy, which then goes into the resistor and turns into what, ultimately? Heat, right? That's what resistors do. They basically, whatever energy gets summed into them goes out as heat. And the, the way that that happens, of course, is that there's electrons running through the resistor. The resistor is one of those materials that has, um, there's a lot of collisions between the electrons and the material. So bam, 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 these electrons are just whacking into the atoms in there, and as they do that, they dump all their energy into the atoms inside the resistor again and again and again and again. And they're doing it at such a high rate that basically that's where all the power gets dissipated in this kind of setup. And ultimately, those energy transfers to the lattice. When I say lattice, I mean the regular arrangement of atoms inside the resistor. The, you, know, you dump energy into one atom. It kind of wiggles. It makes its neighbor wiggle and so forth. So you get these little waves inside the crystal, waves, waves, waves. And you get enough motion that basically it gets just turned into heat. Okay. Um, if you want to ask me more details about that, <laughs> go ahead. Um, after, after class, we'll have to get into thermodynamics and things. But basically, it's dumped into heat. So if we wanted to use it to do something useful, we could have run a light bulb. All right. There's something else useful you can do with it if the slides will advance. No slides advancing for me today. Don't know why. All right, so here's something useful you can use it for. Energy harvesting, right? This is one technique for energy harvesting. Um, does anybody happen to have an energy harvesting something? OK, there's a lot of ways to energy harvest. So, um, some watches actually use this principle for energy harvesting. They'll have a little, they'll have a magnet, and they'll have a little wire that can run back and forth near the magnet, and then you capture the electrical 
uh, currents that get generated as you do that. Some other, it's much more common if you have an energy harvesting watch, it's much more common for it to be mechanical, actually, so that there's kind of a little heavy ball that rolls back and forth as you move your arm around, and that ends up winding up a spring. But um, you can also have the electrical kind of energy harvesting. Um, it's used in some watches, and you can use it other places as well. So you can use this to do cool stuff. Any questions so far? Okay, all right. Time to settle the age-old question again. Who would win in a fight? We answered this before for electricity and gravity, but now it's time to pit magnetism versus electricity. So this is just a vote, just an opinion poll. I know we just finished election season, and I'm taking an opinion poll. But full credit for any answer you give. Um, who do you think would win in a fight? Magnetism versus electricity. It's a no-holds-barred fight, battle of the forces. Who's stronger? All right, the opinions are still rolling in, but would you like to know the results of our completely scientific opinion poll? Roughly 44 or 52 slight favoring to electricity, slight favor. So our current projections, current projections for that could be that electricity wins. But we should actually do the calculation. OK, we're going to use a cool trick to find out. Here's the one cool trick. Use this one cool trick to find out. The one cool trick you need to do this calculation is, it turns out, I'm not going to prove this to you, but you, you can scribble out the, the math yourself. Um, mu naught times epsilon naught happens to equal a very familiar face in physics. The very familiar face is 1 over c squared. c is the symbol we always use for the speed of light. The speed of light in vacuum is c. So it turns out that mu naught times epsilon naught is 1 over c squared. So these guys have been appearing in our equations. So which one of these is the electric one? Epsilon naught. OK, epsilon naught shows up in our electric equations. Which one's the magnetic one? By process of elimination, mu naught. Mu naught is the, is the magnetic one. So the magnetic equations have this mu naught running around. The electric equations have this epsilon naught running around. And it turns out when you multiply them together, you get 1 over c squared. So we're going to use that to, um, to answer that. So let's set things up, all right? Let me set things up. We'll set up the fair fight. We'll go kind of through the electric forces and then the magnetic forces. So let me have two positively charged particles. Let's uh, do that mind like water thing they do in, in martial arts. Just clear your mind. Pretend the only thing in the universe is these two positively charged particles, OK? Number one and number two, cleverly named. What kind of force do they feel? Yeah, there's a Coulomb, OK? There's a Coulomb repulsion on these guys, and that's what we would measure, OK? We would measure a Coulomb repulsion so that there's a, there's a force equals QE on these guys. Each one exerts an electric field. So the po each positively charged particle exerts an electric field out in space. The other charged particle feels that electric field. And then there's a force. <clears throat> Do you have any questions about that so far? So it's definitely the electric field. Now I'm going to move them, OK? Let's have them move relative to us at constant velocity. And so we watch these two positively charged particles moving by. We know they have this electric force between them. Now, is there magnetism involved now? OK, all right. Why? I'm hearing some no's and I'm hearing some yeses. So yeah. OK, so the velocity causes a magnetism to happen, right? So. So a, a charged particle just by itself exerts a, an electric field. If the thing is moving, then we also observe a magnetic field is present. Okay? So they're moving, so they're both causing magnetic fields to happen. So there must be a QV crust B as well. They still have this electrical force, and now there's going to be a magnetic force between them. And in fact, you've already seen it with, um, with the wires. right? When we run the current, we're going to run it in the parallel case, there's an attraction there. Okay. So these guys are going to have something very similar happen as well. All right, so to remind you of, of the, the magnetic part, this, this demo here, we already figured out before, we could think in terms of current going parallel. We said when we had two wires with parallel current, I could think in terms of one wire on the other, what are the forces between these guys. So we broke it up into, this is from the last lecture, lecture 19. So I have current in the red wire, current in the blue wire. And the red wire exerts, a, we're going to call it a red magnetic field. Okay, I can use the right hand rule for that. Current goes this way. Magnetic field is coming out towards you up here. 
and the blue wire feels that, then we have the I delta L cross B that the, the blue wire feels. So the blue wire has a current going this direction. I um, crossed into the B is coming out to you guys, and then the force went downward on the blue wire. And then equal and opposite meant these guys were attracted to each other. So that's this demo here. And that's a very similar situation, right? So here I have current going to the right. Here I have two protons going to the right. Okay, so two positively charged particles moving to the right. Very similar to what we already thought of. And so there should be that magnetic uh, attractive force between them. So we'll, we'll build it up slowly, though. Let's do the electric force first. So first, just think in terms of electric forces. Here's the total force we're going to have to consider, QE plus QV cross B, but first electricity. And let me just zoom in on particle two. So I'm going to think of the, the first particle, particle one, okay, positively charged particle. It exerts an electric field in space. As it's moving, it also exerts a magnetic field in space. And I want to think about the effect on particle two. So particle two feels this electric field. What's the electric field due to particle one? It's 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, Q1 over R squared times R hat. And then the electric force on particle 2 is it feels that field and then multiplied by its charge that tells you the net force on particle 2. So the force on 2 is Q2 times E1. Multiplying those guys together, I have the 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. All the Qs here are of magnitude E. We, we're setting it up that way. So I have an E squared then over R squared. And that's the electric force. And it's repulsive since they're the same, uh, same sign of the charge, so it's, it's uh, downward. Do you have any questions about that one so far? OK, so there's a repulsive electric force. That was no surprise. OK, there's a magnetic force, so let's calculate that. And then we're going to let these guys duke it out and see which one wins. So we have a magnetic field. Again, thinking along the same lines, I want to calculate the effects on particle 2. OK, so particle 1 puts out its electric field. Because particle 1's moving, it also puts out a magnetic field. And that magnetic field, due to the moving particle 1, is mu naught over 4 pi, q1, v1, cross r hat over r squared. Okay, So then the magnetic force on 2, actually I should tell you which direction that goes. But um, it's the same as this double wire experiment. So I have um, this positively charged particle going this direction. Uh, I need to then calculate V cross R hat. OK, so here's, I need to figure out which direction this magnetic field goes in for this positively charged particle. If we go back to the Biot-Savar law, which has the V cross R hat, R points to me, right? So I always put myself at the observation point. So I'm going to have the observation point be here at particle 2. R points to me, so R points from particle 1 down to our observation point. So that tells me then V cross R hat goes that way, and then um, the magnetic field is pointing back into the board right there. Okay, So step one is, where is that magnetic field pointing back into the board? Does that make sense? You could also have thought of it as, OK, this is a positively charged particle, and I can think in terms of current, put my thumb along the current, and then my fingers curl in the direction of magnetic field. So there's a magnetic field at particle two due to particle one. Right, and it's pointing into the board. So now this guy has a force on it because it's a charged particle moving through a magnetic field that's crossed to its path. So I'll have a QV cross B term. So QV cross B in this case, all right, we've got the V crossed into B, right? So I put my hand in the direction of V, or it's probably clearer if I just do the, the, the fingers. So V is the index finger, then B is back into the board, and then uh, the force is going to be up. So the magnetic force up on this guy. Here's the magnitudes, right? I take the magnetic field. Magnetic field had a mu naught over 4 pi. There it is. The Q is of magnitude E. There's one power of velocity. There's another power of velocity here, OK? And then another power of charge, and then it's all over R squared. So altogether, we got mu naught over 4 pi, E squared, V squared over R squared. Why did I use the same symbol for V1 and V2? Yeah, it's just the way we set up the problem. That's all it is, OK? I've set up the problem such that these are both moving at the same velocity, v. OK? So that's why v is appearing here twice. Really, it's a v1 times a v2. OK? So there's our net, uh, the net magnetic force that we observe. We have to remember, of course, as soon as we say velocities are involved, we have to be real clear that this is relative to the lab frame. So the lab frame is us. We've got those 
char positively charged particles moving by at velocity v relative to us, the observers, and that's the v that goes into that equation. So there's the magnetic force. Do you have questions on that so far? Okay, the main thing that I want you to get out of this is that the magnetic force depends not only on mu naught, but also on that velocity. Okay. All right, so putting them together, so, so now let's, let's compare. Who would win in a fight? Um, I have the electric force in this corner, and I have the magnetic force in this corner. So the electric force on particle 2 we already calculated was 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, e squared over r squared. Uh, times r hat. The magnetic force on particle 2, we already calculated. Its magnitude was mu naught over 4 pi, e squared v squared over r squared. So if I just look at these forces, the similarities okay, are that there's an e squared in both, there's a 1 over r squared in both, there's even a 1 over 4 pi in both. So now I just want to take the ratio. right? We'll use this one cool trick that mu naught times epsilon naught is 1 over c squared. And now when I take the ratio of these forces, I'm going to say, OK, take the magnetic force divided by the electric force. So here's the magnetic force. We already calculated it. It's mu naught over 4 pi, e squared v squared over r squared. Now divide by the magnitude of the electric force. Um, it's e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. So now when I look at these equations, what's going to cancel? Well, I have an e squared will cancel that e squared. I have a 1 over r squared in both cases, and it's the same r, so those cancel. The 4 pi's cancel, and I'm left with, I have a mu naught, there's the mu naught. This epsilon naught is a 1 over epsilon naught in the denominator, so it comes back up to the numerator, epsilon naught, and then there's the v squared. So I get all together the ratio of forces is mu naught, epsilon naught, v squared. Okay? And then we use the one cool trick. The one cool trick is mu naught times epsilon naught is 1 over c squared. And I can, OK, now we always know that particles don't move faster than the speed of light. Okay? So C is the speed of light in vacuum. Nothing's allowed to go faster than that. So I know then that whatever these speeds are, they're going to be less than or possibly equal to, but less than the speed of light. Okay? Turns out if it's a particle that has mass, it's always going to be stuck at less than the speed of light. So we can always say that this magnetic force is going to be less. So that answers the question. It was electricity who won. Okay, so electricity ends up being bigger. Do you have any questions about how the calculation went or any of that? What's that ratio in a typical circuit? Okay, so we're going to have that the ratio of the magnetic field to the I'm sorry, the magnetic force to the electric force is v squared over c squared. I'm reminding you of the drift velocity inside of a typical circuit is about three times ten to the minus five meters per second. Okay. Do you remember the speed of light or do you need me to tell you? I'll put it up. It's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second speed of light. Who's brave, brave enough to volunteer their neighbor to answer the question? <laughs> oh, right here. Oh, you're volunteering your neighbor. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Oh, he's like, I'm not sitting by you guys next time. All right. OK. OK, all right. So he squared them both and then took the ratio. So he said, look, the drift velocity is 10 to the minus 5, all the Units are going to cancel out. The threes are going to cancel out. I set it up that way. So 10 to the negative 5 squared is 10 to the negative 10. 10 to the 8 squared is 10 to the 16. So I'm going to get a 10 and a 16, and I get all together 10 to the minus 26. Okay. Thank you for, being, for bravely volunteering your neighbor to answer the question. Okay. Kudos. So all right, I need to take v over c squared here. V, we said, was 3 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second. C was 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Got to square it. Always remember to square it. The 3's cancel. The meters per second's cancel. Inside the parentheses, I have the 10 to the minus 5. 10 to the 8's in the denominator, so it comes back up as a minus 8. But I still got to square it. 5 plus 8, going to give me a 13 there, squared. And then I get a 10 to the minus 26. So that's pretty extreme, right? It means that the electric field 
is 10 to the 26 the electric the force, the electric force is what we're calculating. It's 10 to the 26 times larger in this case. That's one with 26 zeros after it, which is approximately a yeah, gajillion, okay? It's a lot. All right, so how do I reconcile that with this experiment? Okay? I'm clearly observing a magnetic force, right? You're clearly observing a magnetic force. And yet that magnetic force is somehow down by 26 orders of magnitude from electrical forces. So can you reconcile it in this? What's the resolution? Yes, please. Okay, so there's the number of electrons playing in. Definitely, I have a lot in here. So anytime, good point, anytime I have a hunk of matter that I can hold in my hand, I'm just going to estimate that it's roughly a mole, maybe 10 moles, but a mole has about 10 to the 23 particles in it. So there's a lot in here. So it could be that there's just a magnitude difference. Yes. Okay, could be, oh, the angle. So in our setup, I should put the setup back up. Good idea. All right, let's, this is a good brainstorm. I should put this brainstorm back up. So maybe it's, okay, what are the, so the thoughts were maybe it's, maybe it's the number of electrons, electrons, and that's, that's large. That's like 10 to the 23 in a hunk of matter. And you said maybe it was the angles. Um, let me put the setup back up. So our setup for this fight is here, and I have positively charged particles going parallel to each other. So actually the angles are the same. What about, what about in our constant current situation here, right? What's the net electric force between these two wires? Okay, how are you getting zero? What now? Yeah, I mean the thing is that inside this material, right, actually this has the current going the same direction, right? But inside the material, I have the same number. I, I do have about 10 to the 23 electrons. And I have about 10 to the 23 um, protons as well. Um, and so they balance, right? This thing is a net neutral object, and this is a net neutral object. So the electric forces between these guys have already been, uh, I don't want to say canceled out, but, but basically a net neutral object has, is not going to exert a net electric um, force on anything else. So the electric force here. You know, it's the same situation we saw with, um, with gravity. The electric forces are really, really, really strong, okay? They blew away gravity and it's blowing away magnetism. It's just that it's such a strong force that all the matter that we touch has already had the electrons and protons get close enough to each other to form atoms, and then you have a net neutral object. So that's why we're not experiencing these tremendously strong electric forces. We actually are experiencing them in the fact that they they make up our entire body, right, in the form of the atoms and the molecules. So uh, that's why we didn't experience it in the, in the case of, of this guy right here. Um, it's net neutral. So net neutral, net neutral meant that there was no net electric force on these guys. And all that was left to observe then was the magnetic force. But we, if we had just had this situation of two bare um, charged particles traveling together, the main thing we would have seen is that they would just fly apart from each other. And we would barely notice that there's a little bit of, of a shift, right? What we saw was that <coughs> this calculation tells you that if I go back then to calculate, um, if I calculate the net force, right, if I were to add these guys up, it doesn't even matter that the magnetic force is opposed to the electric force in this case. It's down by 26 orders of magnitude. Have you ever written out a calculation with that many decimal places in it? I mean, have you ever had that many? You would have to have 26 significant figures in your calculation in order to care about this. So who cares, right? No, we care. That's why we're talking about it. OK, so now there's something really cool that we're getting very close to, which is relativity. So the, the, the yeah, wait, this should be cries of woohoo, relativity. OK, so uh, let's think about a different situation. Let's just run alongside these, oh, I called them electrons, but they're really positively charged particles. So sorry, run alongside these positively charged particles. And let's just, rather than measuring them from our lab frame and they're moving by, let's send one of us, OK? Send one volunteer to just run alongside them, OK? We're going to run alongside them. And as you run alongside them at the same speed that they're running at, 
what do you, the runner, measure as their velocity relative to you? Did you catch that? We're going to take one, one volunteer. Anybody want to volunteer to run alongside them? Oh, come on. Yes. All right. What's your name? Corey. Corey. Okay. So Corey's going to run alongside them. He's going to run really fast because he's a really good runner. He's going to run alongside them at the exact same speed as them. So Corey measures that they're at zero speed. They have zero relative speed to you. Okay. So you're not going to measure any magnetic forces in his frame of reference. Okay? So as long as he's moving at a constant velocity, he is what we call an inertial reference frame. He's a valid, you are authorized to do experiments on behalf of the physics world if you're moving at a constant velocity. Okay? It's called an inertial reference frame. So in his inertial reference frame, where he's running at exactly the same speed as these guys, he measures zero magnetic field and zero magnetic force. So there's something wiggy going on here. All right? It actually turns out that relativity is, is, is coming up in this. Because we're having to, to get, to understand the full physics here, we're having to talk about relative velocities, right? And that should clue us in that one of the things we need to think about is relativity itself. So, we, um, all right. What you need to know for relativity is this thing called gamma is going to make our lives easier. So let me introduce for you kind of one of the main characters in relativity. So relativity, um, here's the strange thing about relativity. Um, it sparked a lot of philosophy, of course. You know, uh, Philosophers got wind of what was going on in physics, and the physicists said, well, it's all relative. But in fact, we shouldn't have named this thing relativity. Okay, We should have named it constants. Because what relativity really says is that the speed of light is constant in any inertial reference frame. So C is constant equals 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, no matter what. Always, 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 always. Okay? So relativity is really a theory of constants. So should be called theory of C equals constant no matter what. Okay? So if C is constant no matter what, that means that even if we send Corey to go chasing a photon, right? photons travel at the speed of light. Corey was our runner before. We're going to send him to chase the photon now. He's never going to catch up, no matter how good a runner he is. Because e, as long as he's moving at a constant velocity, he's a valid inertial reference frame. If you're in a valid inertial reference frame moving at constant velocity, you're authorized to make measurements on behalf of the physics world. And then you will always measure that the speed of light is the speed of light, even when you start running at 90% of the speed of light or 99% of the speed of light. You'll still measure that. So relativity um, basically says that things warp. <laughs> How do I say this to you? Um, things warp in order to preserve the speed of light. So basically, how is this possible? Space? Oh, I can't spell space. This is why I use PowerPoints, OK? Space and time warp, I kid you not, to preserve the speed of light. All right? So space and time warp to preserve speed of light. And in fact, they warp in, in ways that, that we know. OK, we had to do experiments and calculations to figure this out. But how are these guys going to warp? They, they, they warp in these ways. Basically, when things start moving at close to the speed of light, when V gets near these things, we get what's called a length contraction. Length contracts. Time dilates. I told you space and time would warp, right? And even masses, mass is going to increase. And we'll see you next time by how much. All right? Got to let you go because we're out of time.